the design, it doesn't matter in so many instances. It just doesn't matter. The aesthetic is secondary to function. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hey, this is Enoch, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture, the show for solo architects, where each week I bring you an interview exploring how you can leverage your skills as an architect to make more money so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on creating great architecture. Today's show is the second part of my interview with Ben Miller. Ben is co-founder of the crowdsourcing platform for real estate development, Fundrise.com. During the past 15 years, Ben has acquired, developed, and financed more than $500 million worth of property as managing partner of Westmo Capital Partners and president of Western Development Corporation. In this show, we continue talking about Ben's perspective of what makes an architect great to work with and how Ben's company is empowering residents to take back their neighborhoods by investing in their own communities. So here's the show. Right, right. And you said you've seen some architects get involved in development. What Are there any common mistakes you see people with that kind of background taking when they start developing? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because everybody's a product of their experience. And so um, uh, as an architect, you're, tra you're really trained to think about design, think about the architecture, uh, and, and that's obviously a critical part of development, but it's only one piece of it. And, and, it, and, if you, and as an architect, you, you know, you're... Every, especially as you get older, you, be, you, know, you become a hammer, you know, you're, you know, and, and, and you're trained to be an architectural hammer, but it, it, a lot of times that's really not the, the, the problem. Uh, a lot of times it's about leaseability. Can you lease a space? You, you, know, who, you have to be a great salesperson if you're going to try to lease a space. And, and, and design, especially when you're doing new development, there may be no design. You're just selling the dream. And so... Um, it, a typical mistake architects make is overspend on design, and and, and it's I get it I, I get why you know that the, you see a great design and you feel like that's why the product um, succeeded, and, and it's definitely the case in sometimes, but other times it's you know it's it's one piece of it and and it's just sort of like it's almost like you would want if you're an architect to try to figure out maybe if your first project how to basically make architecture not matter, your spend on it. Just try to, almost to like handicap yourself. If you're a great, if you're a great, you know, if you're a boxer and you're always lead with the left, you know, tie the left hand behind your back and, and, and try to work on, the, on your right because your right arm's weak. And if, and, and, and if, you, if your left arm's strong, everybody knows your left arm's strong, people will know what you're going to do and it's going to basically be a, a disadvantage. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, that's a good point. So let's, let's move over to talk a little bit about Fundrise now and what Fundrise is. And um, before we jump to that, I want to ask you too also, in terms of working with architects, you've worked with architects. Could you give any advice to architects out there who want to do work for developers? What are some architects that you've worked with that have, you see, man, this guy's got his stuff together. It's a pleasure working from him. Let me get inside your head so we can understand how to approach people like yourself and want to partner up with you. Yeah, I mean, there are great architects. I've had some great architects. Oh my god! Um, what do I mean, they do that's great? They listen. They really listen. I mean, it's it's tough because like, a lot, I mean, a lot of developers don't listen either, and so it's hard when you're telling them that like something's not going to work, the design's not going to work, or the construction's not going to work because it's not, and they're not listening. But as I often, I mean, really fine architects because they have such an architectural like a lot of times in, in, when, I'm, when I'm having to build something, it doesn't. The design, it doesn't matter in so many instances. It just doesn't matter. Uh, wait, it, wait, man. That's, that's anathema, dude. You're, that's heresy to all my listeners. But <laughs> it's about, when I say design, I'm, I'm really talking about aesthetic. I'm not talking about design broadly. I'm saying the aesthetic is secondary to function. And I'll be dealing with a, 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 an architect, and they'll want to put the building, here's a, here's a perfect one. They'll look at the building as a whole. So it may be an 18-story building and they're looking at the symmetry and, the, and, the, and, the, and how the building feels as an architectural whole. But the individual who's, in that, who's, who's um, is standing at that front door, he's not consuming the building's 18 stories magnificence. He's only consuming the first 10, 15, 20 feet. And when you design the building as an 18-story thing, you actually 
are not thinking about 20 foot, first 15, 20 feet, the first story or two story. You walk down the street, you're, you're, you're not usually noticing up. You're only really looking at the first couple of floors. And, and, and so what oftentimes when an architect will design something, I'll take a white piece of paper and cover up the whole building except for the first two floors and say, what does that look like? Would you just, if, you, if this is just a two-story building, would you have designed that this building look like that? And they'll, and it's usually no. Uh, that's why I'm saying design. So it's not like, obviously design matters, but it, it's not, it, it matters in a way that's, about, that's also informed by sort of function, how the consumer is going to consume it. And, and, it, and different consumers consuming the building at all different vantage points. And so you have to get your head inside different people's heads. And that's something the architect's designing from a piece of paper usually. Uh, and so it, it, it creates a bias. Well, I, yeah, I get that. And I think you nailed that question. I mean, great, great explanation. Now, when, when you're working with architects that are listening, can you give me an anecdote of what listening kind of, give me an idea of what that means? Yeah. Maybe uh, a little example. Uh, just thinking about it. I'm thinking about this architect I'm working with now, which is great. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, the problem is that some, somebody's great, when somebody's like a great athlete, you know, they just make everything look easy. <laughs> and you're, it's, great to work, it's great to be on their team. Like if you ever play team sports, you know, it's great to be, have someone on your team. It's just great. And you say, why is he so good? Well, it's because he you know, doesn't hog. He's, he, he likes to make other people successful. He listens. So what's a, uh, I should have a better example for you of like a great architect. I mean, usually I like, uh, I like, I like when they can, can like, like a great architect will think about a building from the outside in, which is basically thinking about aesthetically and work from the outside or, or the zoning envelope and work in and then completely turn a switch and think about the building from the inside out. And the engineering, and 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 the, and the, and the efficiency, and there's all sorts of issues around like um, just like the the real guts of the production, which is really uh, I mean they're just two. This is a part of architecture. You know, people talk about, but production versus design are are just so different. It's the mentality around each of those so different, and they're antithetical to each other in a lot of times. And and architects, it's a, a great design architects are usually not great production architects, and vice versa. And, and so that's something, finding somebody who's able to really think in sort of two levels is, is amazing. <laughs> okay, great. So Fundrise. Now Fundrise is, a, like you said, it's a crowdsourcing platform. Is there, is there anyone else doing anything like that out there? Not yet, but soon people will. I mean, what we do is, because um, it's complicated today, um, to raise money from the public, we basically, what you, we're doing is, is it's um, raising money for investment, equity, you know, real equity investment or, or debt, but it's, it's um, people get to own and profit from what they're investing in as opposed to crowdfunding on a Kickstarter, which is a, a, um, a uh, donation or contribution. We're basically letting people really own their neighborhood, invest in local real estate, and, and I mean, you know, hopefully profit from it, right? <laughs> So you mentioned investing in their own real estate. Give an explanation really quick. What is, what, is, what is Fundrise for people that may have never heard about it, maybe people that have never heard of crowdsourcing before? Yeah, so Fundrise is a, um, uh, I, we just call it, we call it an investment platform for commercial real estate. And what it does is you can go on to Fundrise and as an, as an investor, you can see real estate deals and, um, you know, see a lot of information on the real estate deals. Actually, information usually uh, people don't get to see. An architecture architect may not may not usually see the financials of the project they're working on, uh, or they may not see the, the 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 marketing demographic information. So, the, but, so we try to put all that out out there. You know, we try to embrace a, 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 a transparent um, transparency, and you can so you see all the information about about a real estate project, pictures about pictures of it, and then you offer the opportunity to invest. Basically, the, a, a similar proposition that a developer has, where you get, he invests in, in the real estate he's building, and then and then profits hopefully from the success of it. You get to invest with them, invest in in, in, in the development, and we transact online. So it's like uh, E-Trade, right, or or like um, Ameritrade, but instead of buying a share of Apple, you're buying a share of a specific property, a single, usually a single building, uh, and we and we have prices. You can buy a share of a property for $100, or 
And we also have some that are higher, um, $10,000 and things like that. But it's basically the idea of making it accessible to invest in mobile real estate. Okay. So, I mean, this is how uh, a small person who's not a high net worth individual can basically get a piece of the pie and get involved in real estate investing. So you guys are the platform that brings these parties together, the small investors and then the developers with the experience. Is that kind of a, is that correct? That's part of it. I mean, it's, we, we're very, very selective on the real estate companies we work with um, because it's, it's a, the investing and raising money from people is a huge commitment in terms of, you know, commitment to quality, commitment to high, high I mean, integrity. And, um, and so we, we, you know, we really focus on the best real estate companies in the market. That's how we started. So, uh, you know, Four City, in, if you've ever heard of Four City, or, or in DC MRP, or in LA Rising Realty, or, I mean, it, it's, it, we sort of took a kind of approach where if you're doing something new, you want to have you want to have you want to mitigate the risk. You want to have low risk. So one one great way to low, lower the risk is work with the best companies, um, who already have access to capital. I mean, it's, you know, if you're a great developer, access to capital is primarily not the problem. Now there's a question of what's the cost of capital and and what are the terms, right? How much are they going to try to micromanage you? But um, that's how we started, and I feel. You know, usually I feel really comfortable with the concept of putting people's money. Um, you know, like when I invest in my own my own money, I want to invest in the best. So that's basically it. Okay. So, what cities are you in right now, Fundrise? Washington D.C. and New York, Los Angeles. We have some presence in um, San Francisco and Houston and Portland. Okay. So how do other people get involved in these projects in Fundrise? You know, other people being investors? Either, either or. Um, yeah, people who may want to invest in a project in a local neighborhood, but then also from an architect standpoint, say I'm in L.A. in an area where you're currently in and there's a building, I think, hey, this would be a great candidate for your program. Is there any possibility there to use your platform? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we we're slowly working. Our, we we get a lot. We have um, a lot of applications every day from real estate companies who want to raise money, and um, we're working our way through it. You know, it's you know we we are biased towards experience and 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 reputation. Every developer I've ever worked with, I've known, I've been able to get a first degree of separation, a first degree uh, uh, introduction, and and or or underwriting of them. Because you don't, real estate, which is an industry filled with difficult characters, let's say, um, you really can't know about somebody unless you've gotten a, a true social introduction of, of where somebody you've worked with that person is telling you how it is to work with them and, uh, and invest with them. So, so we've, so, so, but there's a lot of people interested in raising money this way. Um, um, we've worked with actually more and more with governments who want to basically, um, Encourage community development, community investment. Um, so, uh, if you are a real estate company and you have an you know, incredible reputation, incredible track record, you know that's the kind of company we were excited, we really want to work with. And if you're somebody who who wants to be involved in the process, we, we want to be have you involved. Uh, but we're working our way through how to do that because yep. we can't. You know, we really want. I mean, you want to avoid. Obviously, want to avoid failure and. Mm -hmm means you have to take lower risk in the beginning. Yeah. So tell me just really like a Reader's Digest version how a typical project would happen. And from what we talked about before, it sounds like you make a connection with the developer, the developer finds the project. Kind of give me the step-by-step, -step, if you can. The real... Underwrite the developer. There's a, a substantial underwriting of the developer, substantial underwriting of the project. Uh, usually that thing gets... Um, the developer essentially goes on, comes onto our platform and starts to basically to sort of, sort of pr prepare his network and our network for investing in it. Um, and then, you know, we put the project online with all the information we talked about and they transact. And then we manage this investor management platform like E-Trade. E-Trade has lots of investors, right? You're, you're managing uh, the, they call it investor relations IR through technology. So we have thousands of people managed through our platform. 
Um, because invest, you know, a real estate company is not going to want to have thousands of investors unless it's easier, actually, than having one, which it has been because it's technology based. <laughs> so, um, I mean, our, our, our sort of our underwriting and our partnership with real estate companies, it's really similar to how a private equity fund would work. I mean, it's underwriting, it's relationships, it's, it's um, uh, you know, prudence. And, and, um, and there are great, there are, there are really tremendous architect developers out there. I mean, it's sure. Sure. Hey, we lost audio. Ben, can you hear me? No, I can hear you again. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that when you find the architect developer, they are building a product that's, that's not very common in the market. Sure. Yeah. Great architect developer is building a product that institutional capital usually doesn't like to, to fund. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me just rephrase and make sure I understand the process here. So you'll, you'll go visit these developers. So say you fly into LA, uh, you have your network of people ahead of time selected. You're going to meet with, you pitch them on what you're doing with Fundrise and, and then, then will they, once they have the idea in their head, what's the next step? Do they go out and look for properties that fit within your model? Do they then approach you? I guess on from that point forward, I, I'm not sure how the process works. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we work together in trying to find properties that fit. Okay. So it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it's really similar. I mean, it, any investment. I mean, the fact that we're raising it f from everybody rather than only from a few people, that's, in some ways, I mean, that just means we have to be more on it. <laughs> So yeah, but I mean the, the 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 way you source and underwrite and 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 basically acquire real estate, that's not that's not different. Right, right. So then, the developers in the local markets are the ones who are identifying this process, or they do it with you to d identify the potential projects. And then I mean, they... we're really really focused on the on the person on the partner. Find a great partner, then you. You just back the hilt, yeah. Because really, because I, I, what I've, I mean, I, this this the kind of capital we're 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 raising and providing is a much better form of capital than exists in in the, in the normal real estate environment. And tell in me general. why. Um, For us people that don't know about it, raised capital in real estate. Uh, there's, there's, there's only a there's, there's a, Two kinds of debt. I mean, uh, two kinds of investment. You, putting aside debt, debt is is different. Um, banks are their own animal. But when you, but basically, to buy a property, you, need, um, you know, fifty to seventy-five percent of it from a lender, and then like you know, fifty to twenty-five percent of it from, from equity. Usually, more than that. And um, so, we're talking about the the the, the equity, uh, preferred equity. Um, to go to institutional investors, that going to a guy who is managing someone else's money. So it's not his money. He's got a job, and his job is basically to follow the rules so that you know, those investors um, make a decent return. But when you invest in your own money, you don't have rules you have to follow, maybe if you're married. But in general, follow rules. You just want to you make decisions about: is it a good investment? Do I like it? Does it does it does it uh, resonate with me? But that's not that's uh, if you're raising money institutional investor, they, they have rules they have to follow. They have to follow them, and if they don't follow them, they get fired. And those rules um, come out of a process where it, it's safer to do things that have been done before that. Um, um, uh, are low career risk, so low, very low likelihood of you getting fired. Um, maybe have they for short term profitability over a long term profitability. That's a very very classic institutional bias to look for the sh the, the short fast money over the long steady money. Because the guy who's who's in that seat who's making that decision, he's not going to be there likely f seven years from now. He's going to only be there for the next you know. He's definitely not. I mean, almost nobody thinking past 10 years. 
and and so but if you have an IRA right you're in your your age right you're not you're not going to be touching that IRA for more than 10 years 20 30 years so there's a mismatch and so institutional capital you know they'd rather have McDonald's than a local restaurant McDonald's is you're not going to get fired for for signing a lease with a McDonald's even if that's not the right thing for the neighborhood. And even if you, if you do that local, if you do that local uh, restaurant, the, the neighborhood will improve because you have a lot of other ripple effects. But they take a long time to get a ripple effect, and that's not what institutional capital usually can worry about. Okay. So it sounds like with this model, you have a lot more flexibility and creativity. If you, I mean, if you're speaking to the right customer, I mean, essentially you're talking to people. To a manager of money, and a person makes it has just a different way they think about investing. And um, so, I mean, you, if you're able to basically have the credibility and the um, and the vision to, that people embrace, then yeah, they, they'll they'll back you. I mean, there's so many stories of this where people end up doing something, and everybody's like, "Oh, surprise! How was that successful?" But it's like. <laughs> People get it, and, and institutions, I mean, they're backwards looking, I mean, inherently backwards looking. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot more. Um, it just opens up a new kind of capital that really. Okay, good. So let's, um, really quick, Ben, let's touch on company culture because you have some strong views and are doing some interesting things in terms of that. Could you tell us a little bit about the way you run your company and your views on that? Yeah, I mean, basically... There's a revolution happening in small business. I used to run a real estate company. We had 35 employees, five accounting, you know, two HR, five admin, you know, yada, yada, yada. So think about that. Of the 35, half were admin. Doing a, I mean, they're not doing real estate. That's what I mean by admin. They're doing um, bookkeeping. They're managing the organization. If effectively, and and what what technology has been doing is you've been shedding that the, that kind of overhead, where you can basically outsource the accounting through a cloud, you can outsource all expense management and HR to the cloud, you can uh, outsource all the admin to effectively to uh, uh, outsource uh, um, combination sort of phone service and cloud, it, it and you have a software platform that you you put your business on. That lets you do these things, and now I have, um, you know, a ten or whatever. I've, there's ten, eleven of us, and we do ten times the business we were doing before, because because we're or because basically we have we don't have the overhead, and we're and we're technology enabled. So we have every person. Okay, when you say uh, the software platform, is a specific software platform that you're using? Give me an example of what are some of the software platforms out there. But my favorite expense management one is called Expense Cloud. It's on your phone. It's tied to your credit card. It's tied to your accounting software. You, you, you never, I mean, your expenses are all done very quickly through a web, inter, inter, web portal, and you never have any paper. Never. The key, the, the key or, the, or the enemy of is paper. If you stay digital, you can, be, you, you can, man, you can have perfect audit skills, uh, 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 incredible efficiency. Second, you have stacks of paper, stacks of files. You, it breaks the system. So, you, so Expense Cloud is a great one. Um, bill.com, if anybody's ever bill.com, that's a, an accounting, man, it's accounting uh, bill paying software, credible. Um, uh, we use Ruby, if you've heard of Ruby for admin, for, and it's fancy hands for another, another admin software, a source company. Uh, so there's been a, a revolution in small business in the last few years, it didn't exist 10 years ago. It's only happened in the last three years, it accelerated in the last 18 months, and it's going to have this incredible effect on uh, and, uh, and productivity gain for small business. Excellent. So you, these are things that architecture firms who want to uh, be more profitable and be more nimble, they could apply it in their business also? Yeah. It's tough. How many accounting departments are going to eliminate themselves? You know, I mean, are you, 
Uh, are you going to do that? Running the accounting company, no, accounting department? No. How many HR departments are going to eliminate themselves? Not going to happen. Uh, how many? I mean, so so the problem is it's it, it's very difficult for existing companies with existing you know, organizations to do this. Only happened. It was really an accident that we started a company at this time and we ended up not needing all that overhead um, because of the technology. But it's hard engineer into this. Fascinating, fascinating. And so just on a bigger picture, what do you see where do you see the world going with this this change? Yeah, I mean I'm not an architect, so so I, I mean I'm a developer, I'm a financier, uh, and now a technologist. But I think there's an incredible opportunity in architecture. I can see it. Well, I'm not enough of an expert to know how to apply it. But crowdsourcing architecture, opening it up, driving bottom-up approach. Architecture is such a top-down business, it's really comedic that you'll have like these big, big name architects doing these big ideas, and, but in reality, tons of staff doing the actual architecture, you know, drawing the plans. And it's, so it's very top-down, very hierarchical. And, and if you look at other sectors, those, that kind of structure broke down, failed, uh, or at least got competed out of business by, by sort of bottom-up approaches. Um, and architecture is ripe because this information, and as it becomes more digital, as it becomes 3D, it, it's ripe for uh, destruction, which is scary uh, for architecture industry because you, know, you can start doing things in abroad, you can start doing things with a, a artificial intelligence, and, and uh, I mean, if you go really far out, but, uh, and you can do things with, with 3D modeling, check out Floored, F L O O R E D, Floored, insane, insane what they're doing. So, uh, if I'm an architect, I would be thinking of um, how these new technologies and co sort of cultures are changing the, the industry and, and just basically go out and be one of the early adopters of them. It's a 3D rendering software company, but it really, uh, I mean, eliminates the interior designer. I mean, they send a machine into a building room and it automatically it goes around the room like a Roomba, scans everything, and for like you know hundreds of dollars rather than hundreds of thousands of dollars, can 3D render anything you want. Do you want it to be a restaurant? Do you want it to be an office space? Do you want to have this design? Do you want to have that design? It basically completely changes the interior design process. You building everything. You know, if you're gonna do interior design, you have somebody they actually go out and draw stuff. You know, that's, and the reality is, think of the 100,000 people drawing things in the, in the world. Are they really drawing substantially different things? No, there's 80% of it's the same. And so, and that's where software can really be disruptive. Okay, and I know just from the architecture industry, we felt pressure on that. We felt pressure from our jobs as technicians being under fire because it can be done so more efficiently now. So is that sort of what you're talking about when you say this stuff is being outsourced? It sounds like we need to start moving, being thought leaders and more creative. Yeah, you're saying outsourced. I'm saying crowdsourced. This thing is is what is thinking about like having an expert in India do it, and the, and there's a lot of problems with that model. You don't really get the usually get the quality, um, but crowdsourcing is different. Crowdsourcing. Uh, a 22-year-old architect or 25-year-old architect has somebody says, "Look, would you do this architecture for basically free?" And this is, uh, uh, let's say a design architect, and a 25-year-old architect does a design for free for me as a developer, and does a better design because he's more avant-garde because he's younger and he's more in the cultural zeitgeist, and he just and he, or maybe I put it out there, and a hundred young people do it and collaborate. Line and produce this insane architecture, which I then I have to take to a production house to actually concretize. Um, but it's a crowd. The crowd can the crowd come up with better designs than a single sort of like you know more senior architect? That's the architect right now. It's a, no, that's a crazy idea. Not going to happen. And, I, and I'm telling you, that's exactly exactly wrong. It has happening in every sector, and architecture is not going to be the exception. All right, that's a wrap for today, the end of our interview with Ben Miller, founder of Fundrise.com. Listen in next week as we're joined by Evan Troxell, Cormac Phelan, and Neil Pan of the Archespeak podcast 
as they give us a glimpse underneath the architecture kimono and tell us what architecture is really about. Well, that puts the lid on another show about the business of architecture. I really hope that you got something out of this show that can help you have more success and profit in the world of architecture. And if you want to join the discussion about this episode, you can find it on the podcast page on businessofarchitecture.com. And while you're there, feel free to share the show using the social media share links. If you sign up for the Business of Architecture Insider List, I'll send you other resources like the Architect Marketing Guide and information on how to use web tools to get more visibility for your firm and your work. Everybody knows that you just gotta do it.